So there are a number of vehicles here at Fort Lee which are interesting but not deserving necessarily of a full inside hatch video, either because they are just not in a suitable condition inside uh, or because there's only one or two interesting little things to note. So I have decided I'm going to, I'm going to restart the old snapshot series. So don't expect a full tour of the vehicle, but you are going to see some interesting things that you won't see anywhere else. And I'm starting with Thunderbolt. And uh, if you know the, uh, the old promo pictures or even the Tamiya M1 kit had decals for this particular, this is actually the original Thunderbolt that, that, that rolled out all those many years ago. And what it is, it is the first of the low rate initial production M1. So technically, I guess it's not really an XM1 at all. There are a couple of older ones out there, but uh, this is unique because, well, it's the first of the production ones and it's, we know it is the vehicle as it appeared way back on a display back then. So I'm gonna go around it really quick and show you some of the features of the really, really old M1s uh, that may or may not surprise people who are more familiar with the M1 of today. And I'm going to start off obviously with the 105. Well, that's not particularly new. Neither is the front slope, the driver's position, the headlights uh, with the removable front to change from infrared to daylight. Uh, coax and gas are in the same place. Uh, fuel tanks are in the same place. What is not in the same place, well, we'll have a look up top, is uh, the CITV position. I'm now going to show an inset of the uh, track tensioning system, it's the old type of uh, piston where you had to loosen a locking nut in, uh, put some grease in and then tighten the locking nut again. An extra step needs an extra tool. The current version of the tensioning piston doesn't require it. But otherwise it is typical M1. So you have a, uh, a bolt here to remove. You got this safety pin here. And then what you can do is use a, a tanker bar, a pry bar, insert in here. You can open it up and access the rest of the suspension. Of course, you only want to open up one of these, uh, one of these at a time because they are armored and they're a little bit heavy. At least the first few are. So as you come around to the back, well, we've got a couple of points to note here. Firstly, you'll see that the stowage rack are just these three rails that stop short of the tail of the turret. There is no bustle rack at all. This was a feature of a lot of the early M1s. Uh, if I recall, the bustle didn't show up until the IPs. There is also no turret stowage bin. So the, the, when we're driving around, there's all sorts of little fiddly things that you need to have a, an actual stowage bin as opposed to just rails that you can tie things to. And not everything is going to fit in the Sponson stowage. So hopefully it didn't take too long for those to show up. On the very far rear, well, this is another early good idea that didn't actually work in practice. You will see that this vehicle has the track retaining ring. And the thinking behind it, it's nice of them to at least think of the problem, is that on occasion a track will walk off. In fact, it's the most common form of losing track as opposed to a brake. And it's a sort of a gradual event. It, it doesn't just immediately pop off in the vast majority of cases. And indeed, if you're a switched on crew, you will get a, an indicator that the track is about to walk off. You, you hear a sort of a popping sound, a thudding, and that's your, that's your like three second warning, hit the brake immediately. You have a problem, you can get out, investigate, maybe walk it back on without having to brake and rejoin the track. So the thinking behind the track retaining ring is that the track can't actually gradually walk off because this big you know, half inch of metal, actually it's more than a half inch, is three quarter inch maybe, is keeping the track in place. Fine in theory. The problem, the track didn't care. So it turns out that the force of the track moving outwards is stronger than the force of the, the tapered metal trying to fight and push it back in. So eventually the track will come off. It may bend the retaining ring, which of course as it's going around is now going to catch 
the number seven skirt and rip that off and make a god awful mess. So what you will see happen a lot in the early mid 80s is either the number seven skirt was just removed and tanks will go around with the, with the front six and you'll see the sprocket wheel in the back probably with the retaining ring steel. Option number two, they took the retaining ring off and they kept the number seven skirt. Option number three, and this was kind of the way they went eventually in the end anyways, you will see these number sevens just get cut. They, uh, they simply cut away a gouge and part of the thinking for that was not only did it release the probability of getting things getting caught as you go around, uh, but also it allowed better removal of mud that got uh, thrown up and it could then get discarded out the, uh, out the tracks. In fact, now we're looking to look for mud shoots in the sprocket. Yep, there are mud shoots in the sprocket. As for the top of the vehicle, a couple of items. Firstly, we have the, as we know it, Commander's Weapon Station. If you look at some of the pre-production vehicles, there's one still in Fort Hood, there's one in Fort Benning, you'll see that the mount for the caliber 50 is substantially different and uh, it had a, a sort of a longitudinal feed for the ammunition which then turned right in fact i believe it was still the m85 machine gun at the time before they went to the m2 this vehicle seems to be fitted for but not with a crosswind sensor because that is not a crosswind sensor uh, it's either a replica made up after the fact or they were just in such a hurry to get it out the door that they couldn't wait to get a real one. And, well, there is precedent for that. The blower panels, they seem a little bit thin. It's almost, I, I wonder are they real blower panels or not? Uh, but uh, certainly I'll, I'll have to have a look at an old photo for that. And you'll see that on an M1A1, for example, you are going to have a round patch uh, for a proposed CITV as per the M1A2. Of course, the M1A1 never did receive it. All we have here are the full bolts that are used uh, for lifting the turret off of the vehicle. So you undo the bolts, you, uh, there is a special hook that gets bolted in and with uh, them front and back, and then there's a nush another couple of uh, mounts at the back, you're able to sling up the, uh, the turret. Of course, what in reality will happen is people will place spare road wheels here. This is bad, don't do it, uh, unless you have one of the new bolts that were specially designed for putting road wheels on that position because what was happening was everybody was doing it was messing up the bolts which meant that they had difficulty in removing the turrets off of vehicles for maintenance and eventually somebody in the army had the good idea and said you know let's uh, let's give them a bolt that they can actually put road wheels on the top on so there we go I'm not gonna go inside just gonna put a put inset because as you can see when they, uh, when they turned this thing into a monument, they pulled out the guts of the vehicle. So um, it looks a lot roomier than it actually is. You can see the turret basket is still there, the platform. Uh, you can see how little space the 105 takes inside this turret, which was originally, of course, designed from the outset to be capable of being upgraded to the 120. And compared to the, uh, compared to the 120, the 105 takes up no space whatsoever. All right, well, that is it, your snapshot of a Thunderball. Just uh, a couple of neat features from the early vehicle. Talk to you on the next one.